Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on secure information in the new digital age with ISO IAC 27001 2022. This is Aprajita Singh, and I'm the marketing executive for BSI. This year, ISO IAC 27001 and 27002 will undergo major changes, resulting in significant improvements for information security management systems. To ensure trust in your organization's ability to protect information, you must quickly and effectively adopt latest global best practices. Through this presentation, our team of experts will undergo the key changes to both standards as well as guide you on how to use these changes to improve protection of your information whilst aligning the global cybersecurity frameworks. Uh, before, to, before we start this session, I would like to lay some ground rules. You have joined this webinar in a listen-only mode, but you are welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar using the question box. We will answer all the questions in the Q&A session at the end, and any we don't get to will be addressed after this webinar. We will be sharing the recording with you all. And I would like to encourage all of you to participate in the upcoming polls to have your say and please bear with us. If we have any technical difficulties, we fix those as soon as we can. Today, we have the honor to hear from our local speakers and our subject matter expert, David Mudd. But let me first introduce David. He is responsible for BSI Digital Trust uh, Assurance Solutions like training, testing, assessing, and certifying for ICT governance, risk management, cybersecurity and privacy, digital supply chain, data stewardship, and artificial intelligence. Um, he supports BSI clients in a safe and effective adoption of disruptive digital technologies and to build digital trust with the customers. Please welcome David, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Apajita. Great to see so many people here on um, this webinar today, taking your time out of your busy days uh, on this really, really important subject. Um, what I'm going to go through today, really, uh, we'll have a presentation part to start off with, where I'm going to go through the background of the changes, because I think it's really important that we all understand the why, as well as the how and the what. And then I know many of you are uh, familiar with BSI, but just to recap on a couple of key points around our position and our, our role here around information security. And then we're gonna get on to the heart of the matter, and that's down to the changes within 27001, 2022. And then we're also gonna take a more in-depth look, particularly at the changes to the Annex 8 of the standard, which details all the controls, and also to look at 27002, which in my view now plays an even more important role than ever in helping you establish a truly effective ISMS. And we'll then have something on timescale and next steps. And then what I'm gonna do as well is bring in a little bit of a panel discussion with some of our team from around the region, from um, India to the Netherlands, to all just contribute a little bit to really get a sense for um, what this standard means to all of you right the way across our, uh, the regions in which we're working. And then we're going to open up to a Q&A as well. So we'll then have uh, a chance really to uh, address many of the questions. What's great is that we've already had a large number of questions in. So wherever possible, the main questions I'm hoping that we've I've managed to address in the presentation, but it is your opportunity really to um, contribute, join in, ask questions, and we'd be very, very happy to answer. So let's start with the background again. Before we jump into all of this, it's really important to understand why. I think that will really help also understand um, what parts of this are urgent and where uh, you all really need to focus really you know, as soon as possible. So why is the standard changing? There are three main areas here to discuss. The most important one is that the way that we live and work has changed. Um, we've seen a dramatic acceleration through uh, the recent pandemic uh, in terms of digital transformation, both the rollout, adoption, and acceptance of completely new working practices. 
and that's had a great positive impact to me personally and throughout our organization and the same with yours as well the ability to work remotely the ability to work on other devices other than just your designated work device and then the huge advantage with a massive rollout of cloud services and platform-based services have transformed the way we work but we also have to remember that everything that can be used for good can be used for bad and alongside these changes we've also seen an industrialization of cybercrime and so what we've got to make sure is that uh, an information security management system reflects the way we live and work so whether it's remote working bring your own device and suddenly what we're seeing here is that the um, perimeter the security perimeter of your organization is no longer bound to the uh, bricks and concrete of the building and it's particularly then when you look at our dependencies as well on cloud services we also see that our supply chain has also changed and our dependencies have changed so therefore with this complete change to the perimeter if we are to use these beneficial and transformational um, opportunities and technologies effectively we have to make sure our information security management is up to the case here with the latest of these threats that accompany these new changes and the second key point is the cybersecurity industry has matured since 2013 when the previous version of the standard came out it's been acknowledged that the way that cyber works and though um, 27001 isn't purely cyber security cyber is an increasing part of this and there are some tools and some concepts within here that are now very relevant to an information security management system you know in particular we'll come on to this later but we'll see various frameworks and terminologies and concepts very very relevant to cyber but it now makes sense to see how they can be better um, better used and manipulated within an information security management system and then also we see there's now a new harmonized approach to ISO management system standards and making sure that 27001 is consistent there is again helping bring clarity helping bring simplicity and making sure this management system is effective as possible so there are some changes here as well that are really bringing 27001 into line with the other core management system standards so Apogee, going back to you now for a quick poll so here's something another chance to contribute before we even really get started here what we want to understand really is where are where are you guys now on your journey with 27001 so Apogee, over to you for poll number one I would request all of you to kindly pick one of the options that is displayed. So yeah, again, your chance to contribute here and for us to really get a feel for where you all are on your journey. And um, please as well remember to put your questions in the Q&A um, as we go along. And I'll be very happy to address as many as we can. So with the huge number of people we've got, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. We might struggle to answer them all during the time, but we will follow up and as i said many of them that we've got already i'm hoping that we can include as, as we actually go along so um, please keep your q and a's coming in and if you can let us know where you are on your journey that will help inform um, the next part of the discussion so apajita how we're we doing here yeah. on responses so yes, I hope our audiences have picked one of the following options. Can we have the result? Yes, so 12% um, of the participants say I'm new to the ISO 27001. I need to learn more about it. And 7% we are now uh, implementing uh, information security management system. 11% says we are familiar with the standard but not certified and 71 persons are it says we are certified and need to learn more over to you david right. thank you yeah that that's that's really interesting actually that again this is probably most resonated with the core of clients that are already engaged here with um with certification around this standard understandable as we're really talking about implementing the changes but good to see that we do still have a good core of a good core of you that are really early on in your journey 
Um, so I'm hoping that as we go through and explain some of the detail, even if you're early on the journey here, um, my intention is to make this as clear as possible, uh, really focusing on um, just the key elements and a top level understanding of, of the importance of these changes. And even then, so with those who are, are certified on this, um, um, it'd be interesting really to understand you know, from our perspective, these changes have been coming and we're kind of pushing ahead here, but where we, uh, where, where the, the majority of clients really are with their understanding of, of, of the changes and the impact. So at this point, um, I'd like to introduce Jochen, uh, Jochen Streif uh, from our um, European team. He's the business, uh, business development manager, really responsible for enterprise. And I know this is something you're discussing with your clients on a regular basis. So yes, at BSI, we're here, we get all really all fired up to go, the changes are coming in. Um, what are you seeing, Joachim, from um, you know, around the clients that you're speaking to? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, I've seen that, and I, I spoke to lots of clients who are telling me that they are basically um, fully engaged with information security. So they are having an implemented um, information security management system, but they are still at the early stage of um, yeah, understanding the new uh, requirements and the changes with the new version of the 2001. And, and what impact it will have on their information security management system and what can be expected, so yeah. Right, so it, again, from the BSI side of things, and we'll come on to 27,002 and the important role that it plays. 27,002 was um, updated early this year and there's a lot that we've been doing around that, but because maybe with everyone's focus and you're always searching for key bits of information, if it says 27,001, everyone's attention is grabbed there. If it said 27,002, maybe not so much. Okay, that's an important point, Joachim, thank you. And uh, so I'll bear that in mind really as we go through that though these changes are very familiar to us, though you might be familiar with 27,001, maybe these changes are still something really new. So very briefly, a little bit on background of, of BSI and, and information security. For those of you who know us, a bit of a refresh, and for those of you who don't, something new. So, We've been at the heart of driving best practice you know, for you know, well over 100 years. And when it comes to a lot of the core standards, they all originated really as, as British standards and uh, the BSI team actually were the ones that actually um, created them in the first place. And information security is no exception, which started off really as a British standard in the mid 90s. And that was what evolved eventually into 27,001. So we've been at the heart of management systems and best practice uh, from the outset, and in particular around InfoSec. Um, another key point is we might have British in the name, but and there are quite a few UK companies on here, but there's also many from around the world. And most of our clients, in fact, most of our own people are actually outside of the UK. So we do bring a real global perspective as well. And then the final, and probably the most important point is how we're structured as an organization. So yes, we are the national standards body for the UK and a founding member of ISO. And as Apogee said, we also focus on supporting compliance with the standards through training, assessment, certification, and testing. And we have consultancy part of our business as well. But what's really important here is the bit just above that. And it talks about our royal, governed by Royal Charter. And what that means is we are independent of government. We are independent of shareholders and everything we create is reinvested back into our business to create better services as we have a mandate to serve the public for the public good so that really puts us in a unique position in terms of the skill set and the capabilities and in terms of our vision and our mission and then around the digital trust space alongside information security whether it's um, trustworthiness in software artificial in in artificial intelligence cybersecurity, product certification or training. There's a whole range of services we're applying right now around this space, which where we are actually supporting clients globally on their, their journey through digital trust. So information security is actually at the heart of building trust in a digital framework and a digital world. And we see this as the backbone, but beyond this, we then take this out to how we then serve our clients in delivering that end goal, building trust, around digital solutions. But that's not enough about us, and we're gonna crack on now with the really important part, which I'm sure you're here to, 
here to listen to, but it's important you understand the context, both of the why this is important and why BSI is stepping up now to clarify these points with you. So straight into some of the changes to the core standard. Um, I think you can guess from the way the slide's structured, the ones in red are the ones to really watch out for. And what I'm going to have here is a couple of slides where I've talked through top to bottom in very simple terms what the changes are. So there are some relatively minor editorial changes. So terminology, replacing the phrase international standard with document, nothing to get too excited about and a quite straightforward one. Rearranging the English to actually improve translation and some numbering restructures to align with the harmonized approach. And then we come to in section 4.4, which is around the context of the organization. Here we have the first important change. And now there's an explicit requirement to define your processes and their inter interactions that are needed to implement and maintain your information security management system. So when the standard is looking at the context of your organization and the information management system, it's saying that the management system itself needs to include the processes and the interactions needed to implement and maintain it. And this is really bringing um, that concept into line with the best practice overall approach for a management system, that it has to be built around established, clear processes and interactions and the controls then build and shape around that. And it's those processes and interactions that bring clarity to all. So making that explicit requirement in there both brings this into line with other core management systems. And again, it's that focus on consistency and clarity for all involved. And um, whether that's internally within the organization and also then it also facilitates assessment and auditing against the standard as well. So really, really key requirement. And then we come on to section 5.3. Um, again, a relatively minor but important requirement. When um, we're talking about your organizational roles, it requires you to establish what they are. And now there's just an explicit requirement to communicate those roles um, relevant to InfoSec throughout the organization. So when we're going through down to section 5.3, some relatively minor editorial, a point of clarification, and then the one major one here, which is to ensure your processes and their interactions that are needed to implement and maintain are clearly defined. Now, moving on, we then find that there were references to control objectives and they've been removed as control objectives no longer exist, either in the Annex A or in ISO 27002. And I'll come on to that and how that has changed and now we have a simpler and clearer path forward. But in terms of the core standard, those references have gone. Then we come on to 6.2 and defining security objectives. Another relatively minor requirement here, it says you've got to monitor them. So right now in the previous version, it said you had to establish them and you had to make sure then that they were updated, etc. And what was missing really was an explicit requirement to make sure you actually monitor them. So it's common sense. And I'm sure you're all doing it. So it's a relatively minor change in here, just specifically about monitoring. Now we come on to, in this batch here, the most important change uh, as we go through section six, and that's in 6.3, which is around changes. And again, a bit similar to the previous red mark clause, this is just about ensuring that anything you do, there is a clear process for it. So it's basically saying at a top level that changes need to be planned and have a process for it. Now, again, it doesn't define and specify what that process or what that plan needs to be, but it is recognizing the need that changes need to be done in a controlled manner, and therefore you need to have a plan of how they'll be how they'll be decided, implemented, and validated. And then as we move on to section seven, we then come in with a new requirement, a very small one here, a bit like the um, communication point here um, that previously around security about security objectives. Here we've now got a very simple one that says you've got to decide what you're going to communicate, who you're going to communicate it to, when you're going to communicate, and the additional minor one here is you've got to say how you're going to do it. So that's relatively simple. It's already saying what, where, and when. And now there's a requirement just to clarify how. So again, as we move through um, down to section seven, some relatively minor points here, some removal of um, terminology that's no longer relevant, 
a couple of minor points out in about monitoring and how to communicate. But the big one here is around the planning and process for change. And then as we carry on through, we now come to the next major one here in section eight. And again, this goes back to that same point that raised before, clarifying the need to uh, establish criteria and actually make sure that your processes then are implemented and maintained in a controlled fashion. So again, this ties in with the other two red points before, making sure that your management system, whether it's InfoSec, whether it's quality, whether it's health and safety, whether it's environmental, making sure that it is process driven with processes really clearly established why they're important, why they're there, and very, very clear to all the processes that need to be followed. And then in 9.2, again, some minor changes here just to align with the harmonized structure, and the same with 10.1. So those are the changes really within the main body, the, the core of the standard. And just to recap here, this the main changes are all around making sure your processes are clearly defined and along with the interactions to make sure it's very clear to all whether it's internal or whether it's for assessment and that is in the context of the organization so an ISMS needs to include the processes and interactions required to implement and maintain it whether it's in the planning part here which includes planning for changes to your ISMS or whether it's in the operation which are there includes the criteria for implementing and controlling your processes so alongside those process requirements, which where the main body of the work is needed, there are various minor additions and editorial changes as well. But it's that focus on process that's really, really important. So most of what I've talked about here is relatively standard for management systems. The really interesting bit, and for me, I suppose the exciting bit of the changes really within Annex A, and also I want to bring up 27002, which I've said I think now it's really leaping forward as such an important document for helping you not just have an effective information security management system, but actually making the most of it as well. So as I've said before, the way we live and work has changed, new business practices and new risks. The cybersecurity is, is matured and we're seeing new cybersecurity concepts for managing cybersecurity risks. And so the changes to Annex A and the changes to ISO 27002 are there to ensure your management system is more relevant, it's simple, and it's flexible. So what does this mean in, in, uh, in real life? Well, first of all, I'm just going to compare Annex A and 27002. Now, there's quite a lot of text here. Um, simply because, again, I think a lot of you, English isn't necessarily your first language, so I don't expect you all to read everything here straight away. But this uh, presentation um, recording will be available to all. But I've got it on here really to help you understand um, the basic differences and also the contribution of Annex A and 27,000. Starting on the left, Annex A. So that simply is a list of controls that must be considered when implementing the ISMS. Now the controls themselves aren't mandatory, but if you don't include any of them, you have to justify why. And those controls are derived directly from 27,002. Now in the new version, there are 93 controls and they're in four groups, organizational, people, physical, and technological. Now previously, there are 114 controls in 14 groups. And as I'll come on to, we've added new controls here. So as you can see, there's been a lot of restructuring, regrouping, rationalizing to ensure that the number of controls is minimized and they are grouped into a way that's logical and easy to understand. So that's Annex A. Now I do really want to bring up here again the importance of 27002. So what is this standard? It's a reference set of generic information security controls that includes implementation guidance. And that's so, so important as we'll come on to, particularly with the new controls. Now, each of these 93 controls, firstly, they're grouped into this organizational, people, physical, technology. 
Secondly, within 27002, each control has a clearly defined purpose. And then thirdly, this is new in the 2022 version, and this is really, really important. Each control has five additional attributes that can significantly aid you in categorizing and then in monitoring, filtering, sorting, and reporting um, these controls uh, against different concepts and requirements. And so the key two out of these five, um, one of them is InfoSec properties. And you know the 71%, I think it was, that of you that have been through certification, hopefully you'll understand the basic concepts around InfoSec are, and your information are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so within 27,002, each of those 93 controls, it's then clearly defined which of those aspects it actually relates to. On top of that, another of the five are the cybersecurity concepts. And this goes back to the image that you can see next to it, which was derived originally from ISO 27110 and used in the NIST cybersecurity framework as well. And that is the um, basic structure around rather than the areas you're looking to protect, the processes you need to have in place in order to establish a sound cybersecurity posture, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So each of those 93 controls, again, it says which of those areas they're actually um, contributing to. So then it comes extremely easy to sort and filter the controls you have applied to your management system, to your organization, and see how you are covering confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and identify, protect, detect, detect, respond, recover. And likewise, it means it also very easy to adopt things like the NIST cybersecurity framework within your overall information security management system. So for instance, the NIST cybersecurity framework has a maturity model built within it. So you could have that maturity model within the overall structure of a controlled information security management system. The maturity model helps towards your ongoing improvement and the management system helps support that maturity of the model itself. So they both actually complement each other. So a really, really important benefit here in what we see in 27,002, as well as the changes to Annex A. So as we said, the Annex A changes, so this is the parts in 27,001. So these are the 93 change, the 93 controls which you must consider when implementing your ISMS. Organizational controls, 34 of them are existing ones, there are three new ones. People controls, eight ones, no new ones there. One new physical control, and then very importantly, there are seven new technological controls. So what are these new controls? We don't have time to go through the massive detail here, but looking through this, I think you can see some of the technical ones really leap out. When we're starting to look at cloud services, starting to need to consider formally threat intelligence. There is a few then around privacy, things like information deletion, data masking and leakage, and then some other control activities around monitoring and web filtering, and then uh, guidance on secure coding. So with, and then also some more, I suppose, the more traditional security controls around physical security and configuration management and business continuity. So a real mix in there, 11 new controls. But that isn't the whole story. So if we consider the whole story now, we were 114 in 14 groups, we're now 93 in four groups. Organizational, people, physical and technological. Yes, there are 11 new controls, but of the remaining, 24 of them have merged to make them simpler and reduce the overall number. 58 of them have been revised. For instance, there are controls in there around teleworking. They've now been expanded to cover remote working, which is a slightly different concept that builds on that same point. So when you are looking at the changes here, yes, there are the changes to the core standard. Everyone thinks that they, and we need to consider them. Yes, there are changes here, changes here in the controls. The 11 new ones are a key part, but you cannot consider them in isolation. Just about all the others have changed as well, improved, reduced, merged, and made more relevant. 
So it's very important when you're looking at the changes, not just to zoom in on those 11, but to consider a full review of Annex A. And ultimately, to go through certification, we'll need a revision, a revision of your risk assessment and your statement of applicability. Then also consider 27002. There is updated implementation guidance. Each control has a defined purpose. And then in particular, the new concept of attributes, for instance, information security properties and cybersecurity concepts, such as identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. All of that is there in 27002. And as I've heard it said, the standard does a lot of the heavy lifting. A lot of the work there is done in how you categorize, sort, filter, manage, present. So please, please, please be aware of the benefits of 27002 in supporting effective implementation. So summary of the changes overall. Why, why are the changes here? The way we live and work has changed. New business practices, new threats. To keep the standard relevant, the controls have been updated and the guidance has been updated as well. Cybersecurity industry has matured. So we're now seeing some flexibility in here, particularly alignment with cyber concepts that we're seeing in 27002 update from this year. And then the new harmonized approach, which aims to help simplify here. So a simplified consistent structure and more clarity around process and making sure your system is based on clearly defined processes. So as you can see from these changes, some of them are ones that you might need to consider how you evolve to. Others, such as the updated controls and guidance, are absolutely essential that you consider as soon as possible and make sure that the integrity of your information security system is kept relevant and up to date as soon as possible. So now very quickly on timescale and next steps. The standard itself, it's currently in the final draft and the due date is expected to be end of this month. Um, if we're looking at some of the key issues and questions that have been asked around dates and timescales, I've summarized them here. So the standard is due to be updated and published formally on October the 30th. We will be assessing against the new standard for those clients that need it, want it directly afterwards from November. However, general availability of formal certification to the new standard is dependent on the accreditation bodies. We all have to go through our own accreditation as well. And though we've been preparing it for months, we still have to go through the process with our accreditation bodies. So it's estimated that formal certification, it will depend on the region and the regional accreditation body. We're expecting that to be um, late Q1 um, next year. Availability of training, when can you learn more on this? Right now. So 27,002, which is there is so much value in that. I did the course myself and it really, really helped shape for me the benefits as well as the details of what is actually changing. That's available right now and I'll come on to that in our next steps. 27,001 um, formal training will be available as soon as the formal standard is, is published. And what's the last date for initial or recert audits? 18 months from publication. All certificates against the 2013 version will be withdrawn three years from publication. But the key point here is not the, what am I doing to comply um, with certification requirements so much as what am I doing to make sure my InfoSec management system reflects my business practices and business risk. So it is so important as I come onto the stages here that you engage right now to understand what level of risk you're holding and have a managed careful transition this is not something to think okay well i'll consider that as and when i need to you need to consider this right now transit audit duration so the transition audit will depend just as with your current standard audits on the size and complexity of your organization uh, and it can be formed alongside your annual audit as well so for more information on that contact us and we can go through the specifics around your particular organization and um, one of the questions that came in as well would be the auditing costs um, it'd be our standard costs around information security so there's no extra cost for the new standard versus the old so hopefully that's cleared some of the initial questions and issues around what happens next but just to really clarify this the way we see it is 
basically summarizing into step one, which is the most important step to engage with right now, which is understand the changes. Look at what's there within 27,001 and 27,002. There are so many benefits from that um, set of guidance now. Um, understand the changes, look at them yourself. We have training, both classroom-based training and on demand. As I said, the training is there right now today for 27,002, and I strongly recommend it. The on-demand course is around four hours. You can do it in sections in your own time. I've done it myself. Very easy, very straightforward, very informative. And the 27,001 version will be available end of this month. Step two, check on the impact on your organization. So gap analysis and understanding really your current risks, looking at those changes now, that's so, so important. Those two steps, we would suggest are something you need to be engaging on as soon as practical, understand the changes and checking the impact. Once you understand that and understand the risks, you can then look at implementing the changes and then ultimately scheduling an audit in there as well. So steps three and four for maintaining and getting certification, we're not necessarily saying you do this today, tomorrow. What we are saying you need to do today, tomorrow, is start to understand the changes and check the impact on your organization. So this point, um, Apogito, just go back to you again now for um, another quick poll, just to see from the audience on where, uh, where you see from what you've heard now and your current thoughts, um, what your plans are on the next steps. Apogito, over to you. Thank you, David. We have a minute to choose the following options. Kindly please participate in this poll question. Thank you. And while we're doing that, do keep the questions coming in. And as I said, it's great. I can actually speak from personal experience regarding the training. And um, the two types, the classroom training does enable more um, rounded discussion um, and is certainly a benefit. The on-demand, as I said, for me personally, I found that very, very handy for um, being able to do in my own time in, in um, several blocks and um, found it really, really informative. So strongly recommend that. So how are we doing, Apogita, on um, yes. poll number two? So can we have the answers now? Thank you. So 11% um, of the audience have already started the implementing with these changes and 33% of the audience uh, are aiming to start implementing these changes soon. 40% says I aim to start implementing these changes next year, but 17% left says I don't know. Over okay. to you, David. Uh, thank you. And I, I hope that what I've brought is some clarity on where to focus. So there's quite a lot to take in. It's good to see that some of you have started already and others are considering moving forward pretty quickly. Um, hopefully here you can see the key point is to really engage with understanding the changes and the impact on your organization so you can assess what risk you're holding. And what I want to do at this point really is to bring in some of our uh, some of our team from around the region and just to really see again a little bit more about what's happening um, and what the um, what the industry's thoughts are and key focuses around the region as well. So at this point, if I could ask uh, Julia, Ravindra and Felix to join as well. Um, Julia, I'll go over to you. Julia Richard, he's our specialist in this area in, in, in French region. Ravindra, he manages InfoSec in India and, and Felix, again, a focus on InfoSec in, in Germany as well. So Julia, I'm going to go to you first. So when you're listening to this, again, we've gone quite detail around, you know, technical changes for 27,001. Uh, in France, I know there's been a big push around um, French tech and so a lot of the high tech and it's a, it's a key area we focus on. So, Julia, how do you see this is relevant to your key clients and what are the key focuses in France? Thank you, David, for, for this question. Um, indeed, we can uh, see in France a strong dynamic uh, associated to digital um, technology company. Uh, and we, we see also increase of uh, uh, different sort of cyber criminality in, 
uh, attack, the potential of uh, of cyber attack today is more important uh, than by the past. And we see a lot of uh, companies with strong IT organization, which unfortunately um, are victim of a cyber attack. So clearly this is a new standard, it's an opportunity for, I think the French tech sector uh, to increase the maturity of their um, ISMS. Uh, to the, today the capacity of answer of the company is very important. So it's not only technologic, uh, technology which could be an answer, but the capacity of maintaining, capacity of, uh, of organization to, to train people and uh, assure security awareness and capacity to have a strong process approach. So the new standard is really a strong opportunity for to, to, be, to be able to, to answer to this um, issue. And the second aspect for French tech is the ability to answer to regulation. We can see specifically in the health care sector uh, increase of requirement associated to privacy and uh, the capacity of organization to manage privacy by a strong process approach uh, is very important today. And the second part also is business continuity with DORA regulation at uh, European level. Uh, and this scheme today can be also, I think, for a lot of companies, a first step uh, in a logic of business continuity plan, and specific, specifically maybe in the second step with the ISO 22301 standard, which can be a global answer to, to this challenge. Yeah, thanks. A couple of really good points there. I mean, first of all, again, this is not all around technological controls. Technological controls are a part of it, but security is everyone's issue. And again, the more processes are defined and clearer for everybody, the more robust that system is going to be. And I think that's one of the overarching themes across BSI right now is around resilience rather than just around defence. And so this is a lot more than building a wall. And again, this is where the people factors are, are really, really important as well. So really good, important point there. And then it's interesting, you're, you're talking about the interaction with business continuity. And that, again, is another key point where two management systems best practices can really complement each other. Uh, a great example here around this is within management systems and risk, you tend to look at likelihood and impact. When you bring in business continuity as well, you then consider the time domain. So you might consider that losing, for instance, a key platform service, um, you know, some problem with cloud service and platform it might be your CRM, it might be your um, operating system, whatever. That's going to be a huge risk to this. There's going to be a massive impact. If you lost that system for three months, it would be a massive impact. If you lost it for three seconds, not so. And in between that is a continuum of possibilities. And when you bring business continuity alongside information security, you can then ensure that you are putting mitigation and planning in at the appropriate point for your maximum tolerated disruption. So that's a really good point there about how those two, two standards complement each other. And then Julian, what you're saying as well around industry and regulation, what we are seeing, we've got a, a new certification around GDPR coming out shortly. And again, 27,001 is at the heart of that. I know in France for the healthcare industry, again, there's regulation there. Again, 27,001 sits at the heart of it. So two points there from Julian in France. One is how this interacts with other standards to build overall a resilient um, system. Um, you know, for instance, we're now seeing the Cyber Resilience Act coming in into Europe as well. So resilience is a key focus. And secondly, looking at the particular specific industries, there may be industry requirements, but it's generally 27,001 that's the backbone on which the others are built. Thank you, June. I'll now go across to Ravindra over in India. So Ravindra, you know, from a Europe perspective, obviously we see India, you know, it's very, very important. They're a huge contributor into the ICT, uh, ICT market and this kind of thing. What's the situation actually there with India, within India around the focus for information security? Yeah, uh, well, in India, the uh, digital transformation is taken in a uh, big way, uh, not just in the ICT sector, it's also in the non ICT sector, especially automobiles, uh, hospitals, uh, hospitality sector. It's just going in a big way. 
recently, uh, the Prime Minister of India launched uh, 5G telecom uh, services, and it's going to uh, disrupt uh, the digital transformation as well as contribute in a significant way to digital economy. The industry's uh, concern is about uh, the addressing information security and uh, very much data privacy. So how this uh, new standard is going to help the industry to address these two main concerns? Right, so again, we're saying that this isn't something just for those in the ICT world here, where we're seeing a huge policy government push on, we're seeing this globally as well, this kind of rollout of, of digital transformation is the future to bring a secure and sustainable future for us all. Without information security, it's never gonna succeed. So interesting point then from India perspective, it's then wider than as we would perceive it as the ICT, it's then looking domestically with India around that digital transformation growth. And this again, really sits at the bedrock of it. Good point there around privacy as well. Increasingly, I mentioned GDPR, but we're seeing this globally, whether it's India, China, uh, the USA, more and more um, privacy requirements. And having this core bedrock of a trusted information security management system is a key part of that. Now, privacy obviously then introduces a whole range of other issues, such as you know, the right to take information, the use of information, and how you then um, delete it. Some of those things around the deletion and, and storage are related within InfoSec, but in particular, it's how you actually protect it. So it doesn't cover the whole of privacy, but it is that solid bedrock and core which you can then build on the other policies around privacy as well. So thank you, Ravindra. Very good point. Okay. Now I go over to Felix, who's joining us from his sick bed today. I really appreciate you um, making it onto the call today because I know you've not been at all well. I know you're very keen to, uh, to join us today. So thanks, Felix. Again, in Germany, again, tended to be seen as kind of ahead of the curve here with taking security yeah, very, very seriously and really taking that up front with some of these uh, the big policies. What, what are you seeing in Germany as, as the key drivers and the key factors? Thank you, David. Um, it's obviously some things we already told. So what you said, 2701 is the backbone, what Jochen said, uh, what Julian said, the, regu uh, the regulations. So what I do here and see here is a rather mature market um, when it comes to ISO 2701 already because there are other regulations like critical infrastructure, like um, B3S standards, like maybe even TSAX. So the most important topic here is, I think, the interlinkage, the interfaces to the other standards and what changes not only between the 2701s, but then further to the next standards. And that, again, a really good point. Where other regulations and standards are referring to 27001, this is why it's so, so important that 27001 is now updated to reflect the current business practice here, because the knock-on effect is whether it's automotive, you mentioned TSACs, very, very key emergent um, requirement in the automotive sector, critical infrastructure. If they're throwing back to 27001, unless 27001 is brought up to date, the knock-on effect is huge throughout um, many aspects of society. So again, a really, really good, important point. So um, thank you so much to the, uh, to the guys around the regions for your contribution here. Um, we really want to just, I just now want to answer really a few, few of the questions. Now we've had some questions. Um, so go back to the panel team. Felix, thank you so much, by the way, for particularly getting to us from your suit bed. Please don't worry, it's fine to switch your camera off now. And um, uh, I thank you, I'm just really, really glad you managed to join us today and to the others, thank you. You can switch your camera off now. But um, really um, wanted to address some of the key questions. So we had some great ones come in. I mean, one of the ones I'm hoping I've addressed already, but um, we just want to bring this one up is, can we demonstrate that these changes are actually doing something to add value, or is it just change for change's sake? And I think that's a key one here where um, hopefully I've been able to explain today, not just to value two things. One, 
the importance in terms of making sure that your information security posture reflects your business and its risks. But secondly, also the opportunities, particularly with 27,002 now, for making your information security management system simpler, more flexible, and getting more value um, through its compatibility with cyber frameworks. Um, so hopefully that's really helped with that one. Um, there's a good one around um, really looking at 27701 as well. And again, 27701 is effectively an extension on from 27001. So um, 27701 itself stands in isolation, but obviously it will be impacted. But what we see is the a controlled rollout, exactly the same rules apply really effectively in terms of um, maintaining the validity of the 27701. That stands in isolation, it isn't directly impacted, but it is dependent uh, on you having a um, valid 27,001 certification, we certify as the extension of scope. All the same rules, rules apply. So for your 27,701 to be really effective, you need to make sure that the basic security controls are updated and aligned. And then the other benefits of 27,001 in terms of the cyber concepts and in terms of the harmonized um, structure and approach will also help and support you. But for me, the most important one is, irrespective of the certification, your 27701 needs to be built around a 27001 standard that is relevant and up to date with your business practice and your latest business threats as well. Um, some of the other questions we've had around timeline, I've hopefully explained. I see we've had a couple more come in here as well around that timeline. So we will um, we will be starting to assess organizations from november and what we do see is um though we won't be able to formally certify until the accreditation bodies have gone through their process with us as well there are clear advantages in engaging particularly on that understanding the changes around the controls and implementing that as soon as possible we also offer a readiness review so that at the point where you then believe you've implemented the changes, we can then review, without going through the formal audit process yet, review those changes and also look for opportunities for improvement, of how we can help you make sure you're truly getting the full benefit of the um, advantages that a 27,001 management system based around the 27,002 guidance can really bring. So just going through some of the other questions and again around 27,017 and 18 both of those um, refer back and um, at the moment the plan is the changes to 27,001 go through and there will understandably be the basic concepts of 27,017 and 27,018 alongside others like 27,799 for healthcare, all of which we're then looking at um, the all focus on implementation of guidance from 27,002 and all of this as well. So whilst there might not be an imperative for them to be updated, it's more the context of the standards that they refer to was actually changed. So 27,017 is really looking at um, security and management for cloud specifically. And 18 looks at um, personally identifiable information in the cloud. 27,799 looks at um, the healthcare data. So all of these standards themselves, it's more that the standards on which they actually refer to and um, um, give guidance on rather than the standards themselves. So when we assess against those standards, we extend our scope of 27,001 to include 17 or 18 or 2799. So as part of that review, that process should be covered effectively. But if you have specific questions around that and you have 27,017 or 18, then we can follow up with you and see how that applies specifically to your organization. Um, plan, do, check, act, et cetera. No fundamental changes to that. I think the, the key point here is that 
27,001 has been brought into line with the changes to some of the other key management systems, such as quality and business continuity, in much more clarity around the process definition as well. Uh, some of the salient merge controls. So some of them are basically where you have um, a requirement for um, requirement for monitoring the set area and then a requirement for reviewing it. So we're basically combining the reviewing and monitoring together. In fact, what I'll do is we are creating some um, some detail around that. And certainly when the uh, the training courses that we go through explain that actually almost line by line, every single one. As I said, there's about 28 of them or so. And generally speaking, it's where you've got two aspects of one particular requirement and it makes sense to put them together into one that's then clear just as a requirement to monitor something and require to review how you monitor it. That's a simple one. There are others like that as well. So I think we, um, where, where that's been done, it makes very clear sense. And through our training course, we actually explain pretty much every single one of those. And um, uh, that's probably the best way because line by line, that's quite a lot to go through. Um, just looking through some of the other questions. So, um, great one here, looking at if you're using 27,002 version already, will there be a problem in the first surveillance audit next year? Short answer is no. As we said, we will be, we'll be capable of assessing against the, um, the new version of both 27,001 and considering how 27,002 is uh, employed from the start of November. In terms of formal certification, until we have received our formal accreditation, we wouldn't be able to issue a formal certificate against it, but we can still assess using the 2022 versions, provide continuity with your 2013 certification and uh, an attestation that you're actually compliant with the 2022 version to be updated once um, we can then actually formally certify. So we aim to make that as easy as possible because we want you all to engage with the 27 with the 2022 version absolutely as soon as possible to make sure you are providing the best protection for your information and your assets oh i just realized i'm so sorry i'm getting carried away here we've run out of time um so at this point um i'm sorry there's loads more questions here we haven't answered we'll endeavor to get back to you all so um I'm just going to summarize, and in the meantime, Apogita, if you wouldn't mind just going through uh, um, a third poll now, we just want to see really from your perspective for the audience, thank you so much for joining us. So many of you have stayed all the way through, which I really appreciate. If you wouldn't mind just sharing now with you what your thoughts are on potential next steps um, while I just start to summarize, so Apogita. Thank you, David. Uh, can we have the last uh, poll question? yeah so kindly so, uh help us to understand the needs and the requirements you might have the bsi uh so that we can support you in your ims transition journey kindly choose one of the options thanks apogita so this is this is actually a, a private poll we're just putting the question out there just so we know uh from your perspective uh, to the audience what are the key steps so i just want to summarize again really what what uh, we've been going through today. Why is this changing? The number one reason why the standard is changing is because the way we work has changed and the vulnerabilities and risks have changed. So therefore it's fundamentally important that you engage with these changes as quickly as you can to understand them and understand the impact on your business. On top of that, recognizing the developments in the cybersecurity industry, now there is a structure in place supported by the guidance and the attributes in 27002 to enable you to quickly and effectively shape your information shape your controls and how you present manage and um, generally interact with other stakeholders in a way that's simple and more effective particularly around cybersecurity concepts and around the basics of infosec confidentiality integrity and availability thirdly the fundamental changes across the board to management systems. This is now bringing 27,001 into that fold with a much more strong, with a much stronger focus on making sure your processes are clearly defined. 
So this is, goes beyond technical controls now, and this makes sure everybody, internal and external, can understand clearly what's expected of them. So I trust this has been useful for you. I really would appreciate your feedback. And once again, thank you for so many of you from around, uh, around the region for joining us today. And please engage with uh, getting a copy of visibility of those standards and engage with that training as soon as possible. I wish you success on your journey. Thank you, Apajita, back to you. Thank you, David. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone for attending uh, today's webinar. Uh, thank you to all our speakers for this insightful session. And all our participants uh, today will receive a link uh, to the recording of this webinar, as well as links to the available transition resources. However, in order to get this great content, you must complete the post event survey that will pop, pop up as soon as this webinar is completed. Uh, and if you have any questions regarding the transition or any other requirements, please indicate that on the survey and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, thank you once again for attending this session and have a great day. Thank you.